This fishbowl represents an ecosystem. It is a place where living and non-living things interact with each other. Abiotic factors are the non-living components of an ecosystem. In the fishbowl, this includes the water and its temperature, the rocks, and the amount of oxygen. Biotic factors are living factors. The fish and the plants are the biotic factors in the fishbowl ecosystem. Organisms instinctively reproduce as many times as possible. Populations have the potential to increase indefinitely. But an ecosystem can only support a certain number of individuals. Why? Let's look at the growth of the fish population once again on this graph here. What does that dotted line represent? And why can't the population increase after it? The dotted line represents the carrying capacity of the fishbowl ecosystem. The carrying capacity is the maximum population that can be supported by an ecosystem. Notice that we say support, not fit or hold. We could fit a lot of fish in the fishbowl, but we can only support a certain number of individuals. Populations that surpass the carrying capacity cannot be supported. There are not enough resources to support all individuals. Stable populations remain near the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is determined by the amount of resources in the environment. Environmental factors that prevent populations from further increasing are called limiting factors. In aquatic ecosystems, available oxygen is often a limiting factor. If resources increase, carrying capacity increases as well. But in our fishbowl, it wasn't a matter of space. It was more likely the amount of oxygen that limited the growth of the fish population. If we add more plants, they'll produce more oxygen. And if there's more oxygen in the fishbowl, the carrying capacity can increase. We can support more fish. If the carrying capacity increases, the population will increase as well. Carrying capacity, the maximum number of individuals that can be supported by an ecosystem. an interview with Dr. William R. Catton, Jr., conducted on August 9, 2008, at his home near Tacoma in Washington State. Most of the questions in this interview will focus on Dr. Catton's book, Overshoot, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change. This book, which was published in 1980, analyzed humankind's ecological predicament with extraordinary courage and insight. It is now becoming widely recognized as a seminal statement that has been ignored far too long. Now, Dr. Catton, your education is in sociology and your early research was on purely social issues, problem drinking, organizational behavior, etc. How did you come to address the ecological issues of carrying capacity and overshoot? When I was at the University of Washington, I was uh, for several years on the university's library committee the chairman of that committee happened to be a professor of forestry. And so we always had our meetings down in the um, College of Forest Resources, as it was then called. I also uh, happened to collaborate for a while with another professor of forestry, Frank Brockman, who had been a, uh, a park naturalist in uh, Mount Rainier National Park early on, and then subsequently he was transferred to Yosemite National Park. In the summertime particularly, but really throughout the year while we were living in Seattle, my family spent a lot of our time at Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, we were devotees of the national park system, really. And I particularly enjoyed the exhibits in visitor centers in these national parks. 
and began to learn some ecological ideas from those exhibits. Uh, working with Frank Brockman on uh, the attitudes of backcountry users in the national parks. I began to see that there were a number of us, not just my own family, who deplored the overuse of some of these areas. And so I began to be much more sensitive to population pressure than I might have otherwise been. At the same time, the University of Washington was growing. The enrollment more than doubled during the years that I was there, from about 16,000 when I went there as a graduate student to well over 32,000 before uh, I left there. And all of those influences um, just made me think more nearly in terms of population pressure than just the sheer uh, idea of population numbers. I was aware of the fact that um, politicians, uh, particularly local politicians, always seemed to be in favor of growth. Uh, the growth of Seattle was a good thing in their book. Um, builders, in particular, enjoyed the fact that the Puget Sound area was becoming more and more populated, and that meant more and more market for new, new houses, new construction. Um, from my point of view, some of the glory of that area was being diminished by the increase in population. One summer I worked on a research project through the summer, and I managed to arrange my work on that project such that I could uh, re regard Monday and Tuesday as my weekend instead of Saturday and Sunday. I worked through Saturday and Sunday in my office. And we would take off late Sunday afternoon to head up to the campground at Mount Rainier. And we would pass all the homecoming traffic as we were going to the park. And we could take our choice among all the different campsites. Whereas the people who had been there on the real weekend uh, were <laughs> facing the crowds. There was one weekend when we were going with some visitors, and so we had to take the regular Saturday-Sunday weekend, and we had a hard time finding a suitable campsite when we got there. So the experiences like that sensitized me to the impact of population pressure. But that was only one of many variables that I subsequently began to learn were important in understanding how ecosystems function. At least that was a, a start. The Earth is losing the ability to support complex life. Okay, we're seeing an ominous erosion of our planet's life support systems across the board. The first chapter of your book is titled The Unfathomed Predicament of Mankind. What predicament were you referring to? The predicament that I was referring to really deals with the fact that we live in a culture that was largely shaped by the experience of Europeans moving to what they defined as a, the new world when it was new, when the population density here of uh, people we now call Native Americans, that we then called Indians, um, was so much less than the density of population in Europe at the time. Um, our institutions were based on the assumption that there was room to grow. Our values were based on the freedoms that you could have when there's that much open space to be used, when the resources had barely begun to be tapped that would later be tapped in uh, large measure and uh, would become scarce. Okay, after several centuries of the kind of growth that happened after the beginning of European colonization of the New World, we are now more densely populated in North America than Europe was at the time that uh, that began. And we are a much larger species than we were then, not in terms of our own body size, but in terms of all the apparatus that we use to uh, uh, live in a modern lifestyle. Uh, and uh, so 
The predicament that we face is that we've converted what started out to be a vast carrying capacity surplus into what is now a carrying capacity deficit, where the load that we're imposing upon the ecosystem of the whole planet, let alone of this particular continent, uh, is much, the load is much in excess of the carrying capacity. We haven't yet learned to face the fact that we are now living in a world with a carrying capacity deficit. And uh, that's the nature of the predicament, but we keep defining it in uh, political and economic terms that miss the point. Do you think we fathom it better today than we did 30 years ago? We're beginning to. Uh, there are beginning to be more and more uh, writers who are writing about uh, the uh, depletion of resources and about what happens to the materials that we extract from the earth and use after we've used them. Uh, they've got to go somewhere, and so we've uh, begun to be conscious of, of pollution, but we still tend to think largely in terms of we've polluted this area, now we have to do a cleanup job. Well, when you clean it up, you have to put it somewhere else, and uh, we're running out of somewhere else's. Uh, also, we have too long used the atmosphere of the planet as a garbage dump, and we're now beginning to have the repercussions of uh, what we've done by way of changing the atmosphere. The CO2 content of the atmosphere has almost doubled in the time that uh, we've been, uh, well, since the Industrial Revolution, and uh, we're now beginning to have the repercussions of that with uh, global warming and uh, the beginning of measurable rise of sea level, change of the seasons, movement of um, uh, biotic communities to the higher latitudes, and um, disruption of many aspects of human life that we didn't foresee coming. So there's more people writing about that. There's more public awareness of it. The, even though there are many people who still doubt the reality of global warming, at least the vast majority of the public is now familiar with that phrase. And uh, so, yes, I think we're more perceptive than we were at the time I was writing. The human enterprise, our inexorable expansion, has really severely degraded all of our ecosystems on this planet. There's a huge reticence of scientists still to come clean and tell people exactly how bad things are. You state repeatedly that we are stealing from the future. What is the nature of this theft? Resources that we use today, since uh, they include uh, a preponderance of non-renewable resources, are resources that will be unavailable to posterity. That's the sense in which we're stealing directly from the future. We're also, by changing the conditions of life, inadvertently through our waste disposal and so on, uh, making um, areas that were marvelously habitable and uh, pristine, aesthetically pleasing and so on, much less pleasing for posterity. So posterity will not have some of the opportunities that we've taken for granted. You know, the challenges to avoid a ghastly future are huge, are enormous. Part of the problem of the scientific community and the university system and the way science is done is there's way too much specialization within the disciplines. And that really blinds people. It, it insulates people from the big picture. You know, there's a real lack of systems thinking, joining the dots on all the parts of climate change. And also there's a widespread ignorance of human behavior. You, you refer to the age of exuberance. What do you mean by this expression? Ecologists use the word exuberance to refer to the kind of rapid growth that it can occur when a species uh, comes into a, an environment that, where they had not been present before and the conditions are ripe for their uh, flourishing. And so they grow exuberantly, uh, meaning rapidly and uh, without constraint. And uh, uh, if you permit a bit of anthropomorphism so that we can think of 
a plant species that has invaded a suitable area that it didn't previously have access to as enjoying the uh, opportunity for rapid growth. Uh, there's, there's two meanings to the word exuberance. Exuberance can be just that impersonal, ecological, rapid growth uh, benefit of the uh, uh, circumstances, but there's emotional exuberance too. We feel exuberant when things are going well for us. And uh, if you can imagine the new the population of uh, shrubbery or new population of trees that have come into an area uh, by the seeds having been transported there somehow, uh, having emotions that humans can have, I, you can imagine them being exuberant. That's what I meant. We, we did live in a time when uh, the world was uh, so abundantly endowed with the things that humans could use that we, we grew exuberantly. And now we're in a post-exuberant time because we've overdone it. You know, one of the big factors is the biodiversity decline. Okay, we're seeing rapid loss of species, the numbers of species, and also the populations of individual species across the planet. Some facts, hard, hard cold facts. Since the start of agriculture 11,000 years ago, okay, after the ice left the northern hemisphere, the retreat of the ice from the last ice age, since then, the biomass of vegetation on land, so if you take the mass of all the vegetation on land and add it up, that biomass is decreased by about half. We've lost about half. You say that our species has used two main approaches to expand its global impact, take over and draw down. Could you explain what these are? Well, for example, when Europeans began migrating to the New World, uh, we were taking over for European ways of life, areas that had previously been occupied by a population of people who were still living by a Stone Age culture, largely. And uh, they didn't have the advantages of firearms until they began getting them from our European ancestors. Uh, but they, in turn, had migrated to this hemisphere from Asia, across the Bering Land Bridge and so on, and they had taken over for human use areas that had previously been available entirely for non-human species. Uh, that's the takeover method, when one species moves into an area and takes over uh, resources that previously would have been used entirely by other species. The drawdown method that has superseded that, in our way of thinking, has to do with our drawing down the finite deposits of uh, non-renewable resources, the fossil fuels, for example, mineral ores, uh, substances that do not get replenished in an annual growth cycle like agricultural products do. And uh, the drawdown method enabled us to live more abundantly, uh, have a higher level of prosperity and so on when it was new. But if you keep that method going long enough, you exhaust uh, resources. We're beginning to have depletion problems now in um, a sufficient scale that we're beginning to be aware of them. We we started depleting things right from the start, but uh, as somebody has said, uh, uh, you start dying as soon as you're born. Uh, <laughs> the, th the same is true of civilizations as well as of individuals. But uh, not to make too much of a point of that uh, little simile, uh, we did start depleting things as soon as we started using them. Now we're beginning to feel the effects of that accumulated depletion. We've lost um, over 20% of the original biodiversity that we had back then. 70% of the Earth's land surface has been altered by people. Many people think that Thomas Malthus was overly pessimistic about population food supplies. However, you believe that Malthus understated life's perils. What point were you trying to make? Malthus argued that it was possible for the human species to uh, grow exponentially, to increase its numbers exponentially, whereas the food supply was more likely to uh, be a, a kind of a linear trend rather than a escalating exponential trend. 
Unfortunately, uh, most readers of Malthus focus too much, as he did, upon food, as, as if food were always going to be the limiting resource, as we've learned to use many, many resources other than those that we put into our bodies. Uh, any resource that exists in finite quantity could be the limiting resource. So in that sense, you could argue that Malthus was uh, not sufficiently uh, realistic in uh, paying too much attention to one kind of resource and not to all the resources that we make use of. Also, Malthus seemed to think that, well, I should begin by saying that he uh, he really was not interested in predicting the future. He was interested in showing that uh, population would increase exponentially if unchecked, or when unchecked, as he put it. Most people forget that pair of words, when unchecked. Uh, populations usually are not unchecked. There are checks that operate on them. Malthus was too glib in assuming that the checks would work perfectly and that it was not possible for us to exceed carrying capacity. Um, we can exceed carrying capacity, but only temporarily, by using an accumulation of resources that have been stockpiled somehow. Uh, when we exceed carrying capacity and we get into this period of a carrying capacity deficit, then we've got troubles coming. You say that the Industrial Revolution was the prelude to future collapse. Why do you think humankind's industrialization will end badly? Because industrialization committed us to the use of uh, non-renewable resources, particularly non-renewable fuels, energy supplies. We, uh, what, what, industri uh, what industrialization really did was to commit us to using prehistoric photosynthesis. The photosynthesis that was done by vegetation that grew on the surface of the planet uh, millions of years before humans existed, some of which got buried then and transformed by geological processes into the fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, natural gas. Those carbon-rich substances um, they are combustible. That's not their only property, but that's an important property from the standpoint of Homo sapiens, who, when we began digging these things up, discovered, aha, they burn. Uh, we can do things with the energy that we release by burning them. Uh, we just didn't face the, because they were so abundant, we didn't face the fact that their abundance was less than infinite. It had to be uh, finite, because it's only part of a finite planet. And so uh, we headed ourselves in a direction of depending upon ever escalating use, ever increasing uh, use of quantities of stuff that only exists in finite accumulated uh, quantity. And when it's all gone, that way of life cannot ex continue to exist. Well, that way of life is going to be throttled down long before the stuff is all gone, just when it gets harder and harder to get. And we did, of course, in the beginning decades of the industrial era, uh, go after the most accessible portions of the deposit of fossil fuels. And uh, now we're living in a time when we're having to drill deeper and deeper to get our oil or our natural gas. Uh, we're removing mountaintops to get at more of the coal and so on. So we're devastating the very planet upon which our life is uh, confined. Your position in 1980 was that humankind had already overshot the planet's permanent carrying capacity and that a crash was inevitable. If that was true then, our situation is clearly much more serious today. How confident are you that we can achieve ecological enlightenment and manage this crash in a humane fashion? We are beginning to achieve ecological enlightenment, uh, not as rapidly as I would wish, and we didn't start as soon as I would now wish. Um, we will make some adaptations that will be helpful, but because we have started so much too late, 
having already overshot carrying capacity and continuing the overshoot process right now, um, we will not escape catastrophe. I do not expect um, Homo sapiens to become extinct in the near future. Uh, briefly, I did worry about that for a while, <laughs> but uh, I think the one way in which our superabundance will serve us in the long run is that there will be a remnant of the present population even after the catastrophe happens. But um, that's what we're going to have to face, is that it will only be a remnant. Uh, 6.7 billion of us are so far in excess of the carrying capacity of this planet for our waves, our ways of life, even for our early ways of life, that uh, the remnant will be much, much smaller than that. I've begun to de describe the 21st century as the bottleneck century. Uh, ecologists speak of bottlenecks as uh, situations in which a superabundant species uh, has to diminish in number and uh, only a remnant population gets through the bottleneck. And that's what's going to happen to us, I think, in this century. One of your themes is that, quote, our common plight is not really due to villains, unquote. What do you mean by this? It's too easy to blame somebody for our troubles, uh, some individual or some small group of individuals. But if our troubles are really due to the fact that industrialization led us in the direction of uh, reliance on non-renewable resources to a great extent and caused, uh, enabled us to uh, multiply way beyond carrying capacity, we all participated in the process. Um, the uh, inventors of the devices that enabled us to do this were good people. They weren't villains. James Watt, who invented the steam engine and began uh, the process, really, of our excessive reliance on the uh, prehistoric photosynthesis that occurred during the Carboniferous period that laid down this supply of combustible materials. Uh, he was a good man, and uh, it would do no good now to say, oh, that bad man should not have done that. Uh, he wasn't a bad man. Uh, sure, there are villains, but the villains are not the major source of our difficulties today. And the tendency to look for a villain and then to seek vengeance uh, and to confuse vengeance with justice and to con confuse even justice with solution to our problem is a part of the problem. You refer to a new ecological paradigm and a truly ecological perspective. Could you describe this paradigm and perspective? To think of Homo sapiens as a member of the animal kingdom, albeit with some abilities that no other members of the animal, animal kingdom have, um, to recognize that, uh, like all other animal species, we require resources that we take from the environment in which we live, that we require an environment in which we can do our various kinds of activities, and that we require an environment into which we can put the discards of our activities, not only the uh, uh, metabolic products of our own life processes, but even the whole corpus when we're through with it. <laughs> uh, we have to recognize that an environment serves us in, in three ways. It's a source of supply, it's activity space, and it's a depository for uh, end products. S-A-D, Source, Activity, Depository. Make an acronym out of that, SAD. It's a sad fact of life that uh, <laughs> we have to face up to. And I think ecologists are more inclined to face up to that, <laughs> to recognize it than people who don't happen to be ecologists.
you deride a common attitude that you call cargoism. Could you explain what this is and why you oppose it? In the uh, Melanesian region of the Western Pacific, uh, when the uh, Europeans began invading that area, uh, the native population, the Melanesians, were impressed with the equipment that European and American people had, particularly in World War II. This is when it really became strong, when ships brought all kinds of stuff to the islands that these people marveled at, and airplanes brought stuff. Uh, they uh, developed what were called cargo cults. They could see this cargo coming in, and the Europeans had it, and they didn't have it. And uh, they developed a mythology that um, suggested that their, some of their brethren elsewhere in the world might have been producing this stuff, and it was rightfully theirs, if only they could uh, get the right belief system and so on and um, take possession of it. And they even started uh, building wharfs and runways for the expected uh, transport that was going to bring the cargo to them. Well, by using that as a metaphor, I've argued that uh, uh, modern people uh, expect cargo to come, the products of industry, just to keep coming and so on. And uh, cargoism is my term for the expectation that uh, this stuff will keep coming even when we have already overshot carrying capacity. And I'm arguing that uh, we're really not a whole lot better off uh, with our modern version of that superstition than the Melanesians were with their version of it. Dr. Catton, you feel that exuberance and optimism are dangerous and that we should expect the worst. Why do you think this is the correct attitude? Because the worst is going to come. <laughs> and if we don't expect it, it'll hit us harder than if we are expecting it. Uh, Let me think about a better way of putting that. Sure. Um, one of my first jobs after graduate school was um, in an agency where the boss had uh, a mother who was terminally ill. And uh, she had embraced a, uh, a religious point of view at that time that suggested that her illness must be due to her lack of faith. That if she'd had the right faith, she would have overcome this illness and so on. Uh, he was saddened by the fact that that led her to um, have guilt feelings about her illness. The illness was bad enough in itself, but the guilt feelings made life worse. The last few months of her life were spoiled for her by the fact that she felt guilty about being sick. I think our civilization is somewhat in that kind of dilemma, that we tend to think that uh, somehow we are bad people because of the things that we're doing to this planet, rather than that innocently we just happen to find that stuff that we got out of the ground that was combustible as fuel and burned it and spoiled the atmosphere. Uh, we ought to recognize that there have been other species that have fouled their own nests mm -hmm. and uh, did it innocently, but they had to face the consequences eventually. But at least they didn't have to uh, get sad about uh, oh, how, how bad we were for fouling our nest and so on. You talk in your book about the antisocial ramifications of advertising and the need to get rid of this want-multiplying industry. How do you feel about this now? <laughs> it's getting worse. I think the, the advertising industry is, is an industry that uh, fundamentally does make us want things we don't have. Uh, combined with the uh, pattern of artificial obsolescence that so many of our um, manufacturers now practice, this year's model should be replace last year's model, even though last year's model is still functioning. Um, the fashion industry and clothing, automobiles, appliances, everything else, uh, 
it, it makes us a wasteful species. And um, it's hastening the uh, problems that must arise from the carrying capacity deficit that we have created. We're, we're in increasing the carrying capacity deficit by pell-mell overproduction of stuff we don't need because the manufacturer need to sell it. And the ultimate culprit in this is not a person. The ultimate culprit is the fact that we as a species are capable of intra-species division of labor. We can function as if we were many species. Each, each occupation is like a different species. Each occupation with different tools, different apparatus, different equipment, makes different demands upon the ecosystem and has different resource requirements. And the stuff that any particular occupation produces or the service that any particular occupation provides is greatly in excess of what the members of that occupational group can themselves use. They have to sell it to somebody else and get from the somebody else's all the other things that they want and need. And so the exchange process that is the natural accompaniment of division of labor makes us all utterly dependent upon selling things, either selling the words that I can generate as an academic or uh, the product that I generate as a, a member of a production staff on an assembly line. If you can't sell it, it's not doing you any good to produce it. And uh, so the advertising industry is our mechanism for selling that. Look what it's done to the U.S. Postal Service, for example. U.S. Postal Service now is almost reduced to being the delivery arm for the advertising industry. The stuff that we get out of our mailbox each day is almost entirely advertising, catalogs and things. Uh, that's partly because modern electronics has made the delivery of real mail <laughs> mostly by email, but uh, it's also because the uh, postal rates are such that uh, um, all of this junk mail that comes to us is uh, sent at a lower rate of uh, postage than even the second ounce of a one ounce letter. Um, it makes no sense, really. Certainly, if you have an ecological perspective, it makes no sense. But it does make sense from the standpoint that we've got an economy now in which everybody has to sell something in order to get the things that they want. Like William Ophuls, you claim that ecological scarcity could undermine democratic institutions. Could you elaborate on this? People are free to do pretty much as they please if there are few enough of us so that the impact of what we do with our local bit of habitat uh, upon others is minimal. But when there are too many of us and when we're trying to do too many things, anything we do impinges upon others. And um, so the, uh, the problem of uh, uh, overshoot, of having overshot the carrying capacity of our environment uh, means that there are more ways in which we infringe upon other people's privileges of doing the things they want to do. Other people are increasingly impinging upon the ways that uh, I want to enjoy life. And uh, it becomes harder and harder for each of us to be completely free to do as we please. Now, What's the political implication of that? Well, we have to have more regulation, more restrictions. Uh, we have zoning to make, make it certain that in a nice residential area, you have only residences. The factories have to be somewhere else. The stores have to be somewhere else. Um, houses of ill repute have to be somewhere else, not in the nice residential area and so on. But people resent regulation. We don't like to be overregulated, and so every once in a while we get uh, a burst of uh, political effort to uh, deregulate. Uh, we deregulated the airlines, and uh, for a while, supposedly that was going to enable us to fly at cheaper prices and so on. 
but it's now beginning to drive some airlines bankrupt. Now they're having to charge for every piece of luggage that you take and so on in order not to look like they're raising the fares. Uh, the competition between regulation and deregulation is escalating because of the fact that there's simply uh, more of us trying to do more things than the planet can really accommodate. You said in 1980 that those in your own field, sociology, were so impressed with humankind's special attributes that they almost lost sight of our biological underpinnings. Do you think that sociologists and social sciences generally have finally woken up to humankind's true nature? Uh, some have, many haven't. <laughs> um, there was an interesting uh, sociologist by the name of Pitarim Alexandrovich Sorokin. Uh, born, as you could tell from the name, in this uh, in Russia. Uh, he was an emigre from uh, the Soviet Union to uh, the United States, uh, taught at the University of Minnesota for a while. He wrote a book on uh, hunger as a factor in human affairs that uh, was one of the early ones really to take account of the fact that a human organism is still, after all, an organism. Um, he was inspired to write that book by the fact that he had to live through the Russian famine. And uh, he was aware of other ways besides hunger in which the human organism is subject to the influences of the physical, biological, chemical characteristics of its environment. Uh, I don't know that that book ever sold very well, but um, uh, for a while, it was very difficult for a sociologist who was trying to say things along those lines to get that sort of thing into print because that just wasn't part of the, of the culture of the social sciences. Increasingly, I think it is, but um, there's still an awful lot of sociologists who still talk as if Homo sapiens is a species so totally unto itself that uh, nothing that we know about other species really matters for understanding human behavior. And I think that's true of the social sciences generally. Uh, perhaps, well, I don't know whether I want to say this, uh, economists, I think, are perhaps even more detached from the real world than sociologists are. But social scientists in general are very much detached. Emil Durkheim used the term the economist as a derogatory term. <laughs> when he was launching sociology. <laughs> I can understand. <laughs> Overshoot has recently been translated into Russian and is now being translated into Spanish. Have recent ecological events spurred a renewed interest in your book? Apparently, the sales have picked up in recent years, and I'm frankly surprised that the publisher has kept it in print all these years. I'm pleased. Uh, it's never been a bestseller, so I, I didn't get rich off of it. <laughs> but um, it's paid for a few trips. <laughs> Do you think humankind will ever learn to be ecologically modest and practice the self-restraint that you identify as our indispensable hope? Some of us will, many of us won't. Uh, if we go through what I see as the bottleneck century, uh, the survivors at the end of that century, many of them will be wiser than uh, the people entering this century in general are on average. Uh, uh, any field of knowledge is bound to be uh, a specialty of some people and not a matter of familiarity to most people. It, it takes all kinds of people to make the world as we know it. And uh, it would be a strange world if we all wanted to be physicists or if we all wanted to be uh, brain surgeons or if we all wanted to be sociologists. Uh, I uh, have enjoyed being a sociologist. I enjoyed becoming an environmental sociologist. I enjoyed uh, trying to tweak sociology to make it more ecologically sophisticated. But uh, it would be a dreadful world if 
we thought that everybody had to have a PhD in sociology. Uh, we need other, other kinds. Dr. Catton, do you think that recent movements to relocalize in such areas as food production and work can help mitigate the coming collapse? Uh, that's the best it can do, is to help mitigate it. It will not solve the problem. Uh, someday, the world will be inhabited by a smaller number of people who will be, perforce, more uh, dependent upon local resources and less able to avail themselves of uh, products manufactured or grown on the other side of the great ocean uh, than, than we have become accustomed to in recent years. I don't know whether we're really contributing to the future very much if we abstain individually from buying kiwi fruit that's imported from New Zealand or uh, pineapples that are imported from China or whatever. Uh, I guess that does save some expenditure of fuels and that does contribute a minuscule amount to the reduction of the CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere each year. And so it delays global warming a little bit, but a very little bit. Uh, it's a good, good idea uh, to become somewhat more locally dependent than we have been, but uh, it's not going to solve the problem. It's going to mitigate it somewhat. Dr. Cadden, one person who admires your work has said that you could be read as being deterministic or fatalistic. Do you in fact believe that human agency and political action can steer us in a new direction? Human agency certainly is important. Uh, people do have the ability to make decisions to do this rather than that. Uh, the making of good decisions depends upon acquiring an adequate fund of relevant knowledge. Um, I, I'm a determinist in the sense that I do believe in cause and effect. I don't believe that we make our decisions without any kind of causation at all. Uh, am I a fatalist? No. Uh, depends on how you define fatalism, for one thing. I think one very important contribution to our understanding of life was made by a sociologist I happen to disagree with to a considerable extent, uh, C. Wright Mills of Columbia University. Uh, he wrote a book on the causes of World War III in which he argued that um, it was a good question as to whether uh, men make history or history makes men. Uh, that was back when we said men and now we would say persons. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he defined fate in a very interesting way. And I don't think this is the best definition of, of uh, all forms of fate, but it's a good definition of a particular form of fate. I would call it anthropogenic fate, which is a special version. He said fate happens when the results of innumerable individual decisions about other matters accumulate to produce an outcome nobody intended. And I think that's what's happening with respect to global warming and with the depletion of exhaustible resources and so on. Nobody intended to produce a carrying capacity deficit. But uh, the decisions that many people made to move to a city uh, or to start farming with a tractor instead of with a team of horses or oxen or whatever, um, the decision to buy a toothbrush and uh, practice uh, various forms of uh, hygiene uh, to prolong life. All of these things contributed to human longevity increasing and to human population increasing. And the repercussions of that we're now beginning to feel in the form of this carrying capacity deficit and the fact that uh, there are too many of us and that not so many are going to be able to survive in the world of the future. Nobody intended that but it's the product of uh, innumerable decisions about other, 
other matters. We've had over 700 vertebrate and 600 plant extinctions in the last five year, uh, 500 years. The population of vertebrates has declined by over two thirds in 50 years. I hear you're working on a new book. Could you describe this for us? Well, the book I'm currently writing, I call uh, Humanity's Impending Impasse. And if you want a, <laughs> an idea of what it's about, uh, the word impasse refers to coming up against an impenetrable obstacle that you can't overcome. And I'm saying that that's what's ahead of us in this century. Uh, that's why I call it the impending impasse. We haven't quite come to the dead end yet, but we can certainly begin to see that it's right there on the not very far distant horizon. And it's going to affect not just one country or a few countries. It's not going to affect just the industrial world. It's not going to affect just the uh, inhabitants of industrial countries that I've come to call Homo Colossus because we've become so gigantic in our impact uh, on a per capita basis. It's going to affect uh, ordinary Homo sapiens. Uh, we are doing to our own habitat the kinds of things that we'd already done to the habitat of some other species that became endangered species because of uh, well, we've created, we've caused the extinction of many other species by destroying their, uh, the conditions in which they could live. And we've begun now approaching the time when we will see that we've been doing that to our own habitat. Uh, in that book, incidentally, I do clarify the distinctions between determinism and uh, uh, fate. And uh, I also try to suggest that some of the uh, cherished beliefs that we've had need to be regarded as uh, beliefs in magic. And uh, we know better than that. We know that magic is really illusion. Um, I don't know whether <laughs> the public is going to want to buy that book or not, but uh, I will advise people to uh, be forewarned that uh, uh, the decades ahead are not going to be as pleasant as some of the decades that we've just been through. There's a, there's a recent book that has achieved some publicity. Uh, the Last Lecture uh, by, what's his name, Rausch? Yeah. Uh, who, uh, when he realized he had a terminal illness, uh, decided to dis to say what would be the final message that he would like to give to his fellow human beings. And in effect, as I understand it, I haven't read the book yet, but I've seen a lot of publicity about it. In effect, it seems to me what he was saying was, enjoy life. And I would say the same thing, that uh, don't despair, even if we're living in desperate times. Uh, there's, there's a lot of life to be lived and a lot of enjoyment to be had. And... Uh, enjoy each other. Uh, human beings are a marvelous species, even though we make some tremendous blunders. Uh, we mo make most of them innocently, and uh, we should revel in the fact that uh, we are this species with this brain up here, and with these hands, that can, and with these eyes, and with these ears that can enjoy music and enjoy scenery and uh, make fabulous things and do fabulous things. And uh, let's enjoy what's left of it. And that's out of a total of about somewhere from seven to 10 million species total that are threatened with near-term extinction. The global biomass of wild mammals has decreased 75%. We're getting massive declines of insects. We have only under 15% of the original wetlands left. We've lost over 75% of the major rivers, uh, major being over a thousand kilometers in length. Um, over three quarters of those rivers uh, dry up before they reach the ocean. Of course, we're getting massive declines in coral and kelp and seagrass. And these are the um, the hot spots, the biodiverse spots in the oceans. Um, 
We've lost 40% of the kelp and the seagrass is declining at a rate of about 10% per, per decade. The, there's 0.17 gigatons of living biomass um, it, within terrestrial vertebrates, but 59% of that is taken up by livestock today. 36% is taken up by humans. So that only leads, leaves 5% of the terrestrial, so land-based vertebrates. Only 5% are the wild mammals, the birds, the reptiles, the amphibians. The rest are its livestock and humans. As of 2020, the overall material output of the human endeavor is greater than the sum of all living biomass on Earth. Okay, we're definitely underway uh, in the sixth mass extinction, where we define a mass extinction as the loss of over 75% of all species in less than 3 million years. So there's 7.8 billion people on the planet today. By 2050, we could have 10 billion people. And we're obviously heading to massive food insecurity and human consumption exceeds the capacity of the earth by uh, 170%. Thank you.